This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. What if we really have wrecked the planet with massive casualties coming in the next generation? That would be really inconvenient. But get ready for authority to soothe you again about the real risk of extreme climate change. The awful facts and witnesses are all lined up by our next guest. David Spratt is best known as the author of the book and blog Climate Code Red. He is with the Breakthrough National Center for Climate Restoration in Australia. And I spoke with David on Radio Ecoshock in 2014 and 2016. Since then, he and co-author Ian Dunlop have updated their devastating critique of climate science called What Lies Beneath? The Inside Story of Political Failure and Scientific Reticence on Climate Change's Existential Risks. From Melbourne, David, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Alex. Great to be with you and your community of listeners. Yes, your update to What Lies Beneath has a foreword by a person I think is one of the godlike figures of climate science, Germany's professor Hans-Joachim Schellenhuber. He's the founding director of the famous Potsdam Institute, among other things. So Schellenhuber writes, quote, Climate change is now reaching the end game where very soon humanity must choose between taking unprecedented action or accepting that it has been left too late and bear the consequences. Now, David, I'm in the camp that I think we're already at or past that critical decision point, and it has been left too late. What do you think? Well, look, I think Sean Hoover's voice is really important. As you say, he's one of the eminent climate scientists in the world and perhaps the world's most politically connected. He has and is advisor to the European Union, to uh, Chancellor Merkel, and indeed has spent a lot of time with Pope Francis. So his voice has a great deal of authority. And the fact that he wrote the forward to our book uh, is important because it says to the rest of the scientific community, as he says in, in his forward, that, what we're saying is correct. And as non-scientists, it's always difficult to intervene and write about the science community in a critical way. So I think that's important. Look, he has used a phrase, uh, end game, which I think is, is really pertinent. We know in chess that means that you are close to the end and some big decisions have got to be made and there's not a lot of moves left on the board, and that's absolutely correct. If we really threw everything at this, if we uh, thought that this was an emergency in the way that... Uh, we deal with floods and fires and actually put the normal working society a bit to one side to deal with the problem. I think we could probably get out of it, but the way the political process is going at the moment, um, one can't be too optimistic. So going the way we are going, what kind of warming over pre-industrial times do you expect by 2050 or 2100? Well, look, I think the first uh, step in that is to look at the Paris Agreement in 2015, which was widely lauded at the time. I think since then people have become more sanguine and slightly depressed about the process. And the Paris uh, voluntary unenforceable commitments by by nations at the moment would add up to around 3.4 degrees of warming. But what we must understand is that, and this is the problem with the IPCC reports, that figure does not include any of the carbon cycle feedbacks, the weakening of, of some of our, our climate systems, such as permafrost and Amazon land-based uh, stores of carbon. If those feedbacks are taken into account, it's probably closer to five. So on the Paris course, we're heading to somewhere between three and a half and five. Will we do better or worse than that? That's another question. That's pretty worrying. All right. Now, I'd like to go through a few of the signs of institutional blindness that you list in the What Lies Beneath report. For example, Sheldon Huber starts with the probability obsession. What is that? This comes to really the core issue here. And if we look at the, the, the work of the IPCC uh, over more than 20 years, which is uh, really an assembly of individual pieces of climate research, from the beginning, the IPCC has always had a bias towards what climate models, computer models of the climate think. Now, those models are far from perfect. One of the things they cannot do is properly model what are called non-linear uh, changes in the system, where, where parts of our climate system, whether it be uh, ice in the Antarctic, whether it be permafrost, uh, whether it be the Amazon or something else, 
change, uh, system change very rapidly. So the models that the IPCC use are always conservative and they do not deal with those big nonlinear events. Uh, and the other option is to learn from history because we have a very rich history of our climate in, in the study of paleoclimatology. And that would tell us that, uh, for example, at the moment we have 410 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's 60% higher, 50% higher than it's been in the last million years. And IPCC uh, science would say, oh, well, look, that's heading towards two degrees. But if you look at the paleoclimate work uh, and we look back in history, the last time we had this amount of carbon dioxide in the air, which was three and a half million years ago in a period called the mid Pliocene, warming was three to four degrees above pre-industrial, and sea levels are 25 metres high. So the essence of the problem is that the IPCC process downplays and ignores our climate history in favour of models which are, um, are not adequate to deal with uh, future changes in the climate system. Well, sure. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, it was founded in 1988 to advise governments on climate change how have their predictions and assessments held up over time? Well, in the short term, they haven't been too bad, but they've always been a bit on the conservative side of reality. We had a, a, an economist, Ross Garno, here in Australia, who was commissioned by the then Labor government uh, in 2007 to 10 to uh, do some work on carbon trading and policy. And he wrote a devastating critique in one of his reports where he said, reality, the, the climate change reality is always on one side of the predictions. And if in any science the observations are not in the middle of the predictions, it means the predictions are too conservative. And, and that is, is now well understood by both scientists and, uh, and commentators. I mean, one of the really great examples is that I mean, for a long time in policy-making terms, and, and the IPCC is not just science, it's physically influenced science. I mean, for example, until Paris talked about 1.5 degrees of warming as a target, the IPCC actually hadn't documented uh, the paths or the impacts of 1.5 degrees. So the IPCC actually followed the politicians into looking at that. But we've always accepted that two degrees would be a reasonable target. And yet we now have circumstances where uh, in a paper, perhaps you have already talked about in your program, um, the paper on uh, hothouse earth, which came out uh, a month or so ago, where scientists said that if you get to two degrees, you may trigger feedback from the system that will take warming much higher, for example, towards three degrees. So even hitting, getting close to two degrees might trigger, uh, if not runaway warming, accelerated warming that would move beyond the capacity of human action to, to slow it down. So um, I think the, the, the scientists, uh, whether it be Sean Hoover in the Forte Report or others, are increasingly concerned that the IPCC is too conservative. Many of them are privately saying that the coming 1.5 degree report will be so conservative uh, as to be, in my terms, a political fix. So that's the problem we're looking at. Well, I always remind myself when I'm reading an IPCC report that somehow oil-dependent governments like the U.S. and Canada and Saudi Arabia all agreed to the wording line by line. And, you know, should we really depend on Saudi Arabia for our climate policy? I don't think so. This is exactly the point. The original big volume reports are put together by scientists, and I think they in themselves are conservative and reticent because they're run by modelers. They have an eye to the political issues, I think. But when you get to the summaries that come out of the IPCC report, called the, the uh, uh, summaries for policymakers, they are actually voted on sentence by sentence by diplomatic representatives of the 180 or 90 countries who represent the IPCC. And yes, the United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia can veto line by line what those reports say. So the SPMs are incredibly conservative. Uh, and there's actually some stories around at the moment that for the coming 1.5 degree report, it may not come out in an SPM form. It's due on Monday week the, because the Saudis and the Americans are just sitting on their hands. So this is politically mediated science communication. 
Where I live in Canada, there it's frozen. A lot of Canada is frozen, and there's organic material from ages past frozen in there with it. It's like an icebox full of old food. And once that starts to thaw, there's going to be a stink as gases like methane and carbon dioxide, which doesn't smell, but they're all released. And you have a whole section in your report, What Lies Below, on permafrost. Why? Because this is one of the stories that's not being told. The IPCC reports, for example, give us carbon budgets about how much carbon we can burn for various degrees of warming. And none of those budgets consider that the permafrost will become active and release, as you say, carbon dioxide and methane to the atmosphere, which would reduce the amount of budget because the climate system is becoming less efficient at holding uh, holding, uh, carbon either in the oceans or in the land. They assume that 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 is not active, and yet we have clear evidence that it already is. So this is a systemic underestimation of the problem. And, and, you know, there's credible science saying that in the next... 10 or 20 years, the release of, of, of greenhouse gases from the permafrost could be sufficient. And once it starts, it it's basically becomes self-generating and self-sustaining. It could become enough to negate half of the world's uh, land carbon sink uh, at the moment. So this is just one of those hidden issues that um, really undermine the, the far too conservative estimates that, on which policymakers are making their decisions. Yes, I have a new interview with the French scientist now in Austria, Thomas Gasser, and he's just published a paper in Nature Geoscience in September, and it says that the amount of greenhouse gases coming out of the permafrost is really dependent on the emissions path that humans take. But he does say that permafrost has already begun to thaw, and he cannot see any way that it can be stopped once started and that's just one tipping point, isn't it? What are some others? Well, look, the climate system stores carbon in a number of places. Obviously, it stores it uh, in, in permafrost, which is, is, is frozen uh, carbon-rich material. It stores it in the ocean. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, mixes with the ocean and is, is drawn down. It's obviously stored in trees and, and all plants who undergo photosynthesis and take down carbon dioxide. And it, it, it's actually stored in the, the ground as well, whether it be through particular farming practices or other forms that that store soil carbon. Now, all of those processes are not fixed. They are all changeable. We've just talked about permafrost. We already have evidence in the the Amazon, which is a very large store of carbon, that with climate change, parts of the Amazon are drying, uh, it's getting less rainfall, uh, you're getting more uh, wildfires in the Amazon, and the capacity of the Amazon to store uh, carbon is decreasing. Uh, we also know as the oceans warm, their capacity to store carbon dioxide um, is reduced. So these are some of the issues that are really not incorporating the thinking about where warming might go. And, and the other issue, of course, is that parts of the climate system are what, what, what we, co- we might call linear. If there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we know the temperature will go up. As the temperature goes up for every one degree, the atmosphere will, will store 7% more water vapour, so you can get heavier rainfalls. As the atmosphere warms, you can um, get stronger winds and, he- and hence stronger cyclones, and not, not necessarily uh, more of them. So they're linear responses, which are well understood by the models, but there are non-linear events where elements of the climate system literally flip from one state to another. Um, a great example is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, where early IPCC reports said this will be stable for a 1,000 years. And that was generally accepted. And yet in 2014, we had a report coming out uh, by Eric Rigno and, and his fellow researchers saying, we think that some of the glaciers in West Antarctic have already passed their tipping point and no further perturbation or heating the system would be necessary to produce a, a two to five metre sea level rise. Now, these non-linear events, a bit like the treating of permafrost, you can't see in advance, but once they happen, you can say, yes, I can see when it happened. And this is the problem because these are, are not things that can be easily modelled or predicted and it means we should be very precautionary in how we think about climate change and its future risks. If you have a story idea or thoughts on something you've heard, Contact us, radio at ecoshock.org. That's radio at ecoshock.org. The 
This is Radio EcoShock. I am Alex with my guest, Australian author and climate activist David Spratt. We're talking about Climate Code Red and the report What Lies Beneath. You have a new blog post. Well, it's an updated blog post titled IPCC's Political Fix on 1.5 Degrees C Will Undermine Its Credibility. What's the report and what is the problem with it? The report was commissioned um, out of the Paris Agreement. In 2015, policymakers got together and under pressure from the small island states, what's called the High Ambition uh, Group, rather than just saying we should aim for two degrees of warming or less, which has been the traditional position of policymakers, they said 1.5 to two degrees. And then they asked the IPCC to produce a report on 1.5 degrees. Uh, and that report is, is due on the 8th of October. The problem is it's trying to fit a, a, a square peg into a round hole because we know, for example, that we have no carbon budget left for 1.5 degrees. We already have more than 1.5 degrees in the system right now without putting another tonne of, car, uh, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, and it's also arguable with, with the sort of feedbacks that we're talking about that there's no carbon budget left for two degrees either, which are a, a very sobering proposition because without large amounts of carbon drawdown, we're heading to a very bad place. But the IPCC report is trying to fudge these issues and produce carbon budget figures that literally don't exist. They're doing that by using too low a climate sensitivity, which is a measure of how much the the system warms with a given amount of uh, release of of greenhouse gases. They're doing it by not looking at the last three years of accelerated warming in in their temperature baseline and, and so on. And there have been a lot of scientists who have seen the reports just tearing their hair out and saying to it, this, saying to us, um, I can't say it really publicly until the report comes out, but saying, we think that this report will, will maybe even destroy the credibility of the IPCC because it's become too political. And that's before Saudi Arabia and the United States and, and, and their friends get to vote on the um, summary for policymakers. So there's, there's growing evidence concern that the politicisation of science has destroyed the IPCC's credibility. Right. If you want to get steam coming out of my ears, just start telling me about all the gigatons of carbon we can keep on burning in the coming decades. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I think it's just so delusional. Look, Alex, I think the other thing you need to think about, and it's the point you're making the first part of our report, is how we think about risk. Um, you and I know that in engineering today, whether it be an aeroplane or a bridge, we have very low tolerances for failure. I mean, you wouldn't... Uh, an aeroplane has got a, whatever it is, a one in a million chance of falling out of the out of the sky in its lifetime or in every 10 years. Uh, we don't drive a walk across a bridge if we think there's a one in 10 chance of the bridge collapsing while on it. We are very risk-averse. Yet you think about climate policy, you know, we keep on hearing these things saying, oh, we've got so much carbon budget for a 50% chance or a 67% chance it's not exceeding two degrees. And everybody says, oh, well, that's okay. What they don't understand when somebody says, we've got a 50% chance of not exceeding, for example, three degrees, is you, you actually, in that, have a 10% chance of exceeding six degrees, which is the end of human civilization. So in the way we think about risk and climate change, we're not adopting the precautionary approach to risk management we do in every other aspect of our life. And also really obscene to me, what is overshooting the climate? What's the plan there? Well, this is this is a sort of, I would say, a political fix that came out of the Paris Agreement, because Paris, uh, under political pressure quite rightly, um, from the small island states and others said, we should try and keep warming to 1.5. Now, 1.5 degrees is really not safe. I mean, we have one of the uh, great wonders in the natural world in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. Up to three years ago, half of that had been lost through a variety of factors. And then extremely unusually warm waters around the Barrier Reef over the last three years actually reduced its area by half again. So the Great Barrier Reef is now down to a quarter of its size 30 years ago. And we have research from, uh, from here in Melbourne, where I'm based, saying that 
those wars that we had three years ago, the, the chance of that happening in the future, just at the current level of warming, is about one year in three. So the, the reef is likely to bleach one year in three, and it takes 15 years for coral to recover. So this is a death spiral for coral reefs everywhere at the current warming of 1.1. So 1.5 is not safe. Um, perhaps half a degree is safe, as Jim Hansen has been saying for two decades. But they had that, that 1.5 degree uh, target in Paris, and then they try to show how you could get the world to 1.5 degrees of warming. Rather than saying, we've already passed it, what they said was, well, we can keep on emitting greenhouse gases for another 30, 40, 50 years, and then in the second half of the century, we'll draw all those excess gases down by a thing called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, BECS, which means that uh, you pump large amounts of liquid carbon dioxide back into the oil and gas wells where the fossil fuels came from. But that scenario is not 1.5. It means going towards two degrees of warming and then trying to get back down. So when they say, here's a 1.5 scenario, what they're really saying is here is a two-degree scenario that we hope we can get back down to 1.5, but people don't understand that overshoot idea when they hear these figures. So let me get this straight. The official plan, agreed by over 190 governments, is to load up our atmosphere with enough carbon to blow up our climate and then hope our kids can fix it. To get us to two degrees, to get us to two degrees, which might be a hothouse earth and feedbacks kicking in that will take us uh, much higher, yes. And then our kids are supposed to fix it. And then we fix it by a technology called BEX, which uh, uh, bioenergy, which the, the, the fossil fuel industry love because it produces a market in liquid carbon dioxide as large as the current fossil fuel oil and gas market. So it's their, it's their money future. But that technology does not exist at scale, has not been proven, uh, and is probably going to be very expensive. I mean, we do know that there are ways now to get carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere. Some researchers in Melbourne have shown that the restoration of degraded forests is by far the most effective and cheapest way to start doing that task now. But that's not being funded to the degree that it should. So, yes, we are deferring the problem so that a business-as-normal economic model can proceed for the next few decades. I've just looked into that, and we've had guests who say, yes, tropical forests, they are a carbon-sucking machine, but we've had record deforestation in 2016 and 2017, so we're going the wrong way on that one. Well, we've got deforestation, and then we've got the weakening of forests due, due to climate change, so there's two processes at work there. But, I mean, the opportunity is there to, to change this. I mean... In parts of the developing world, deforestation is, is an economic imperative, to put it mildly, particularly when um, a country is owned by the military and they get the whole of the land if they want with it. But I mean, it is certainly true that if sufficient revenue is put into those countries to give them another alternative, they wouldn't do it. Well, there are a few scientists shouting out about our dire situation, and I've had some on the program, Michael Mann, Kevin Anderson, and, and others. They call for the three levers approach. Now, we don't have a lot of time, but could you briefly just point to what those three levers are, David? Well, look, they say, first of all, carbon dioxide which stays in the atmosphere for a long time. Um, when we put carbon dioxide up there, a quarter of it's still there in a thousand years' time. We have simply got to stop emitting carbon dioxide to make the, 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 the problem worse. That's the first lever. The second lever is that we put a lot of what are called more short-lived gases, things like methane, which have last 10 years, nitrous oxide, which lasts 100 years. We're putting them up in the atmosphere. If we stop them then we would actually reduce the amount of heat in the system. So that's really important. So that's the second lever, the short-lived gases. And the third lever is to find the means for the deforestation, soil carbon at large scale or, or new processes which we can, we can uh, innovate to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the three, the three levers are stop carbon dioxide production, lever number two, reduce the short-lived gases, draw down the gases. We are allegedly really intelligent. Can't humans just adapt to this coming warmer world? You, past a certain point, no. We've spent a lot of time over the last 18 months looking at what are called the existential risk is a risk which would essentially 
bring human civilization to a change as we know it. Now, Professor Kevin Anderson, who you uh, interviewed, uh, is on the record as saying that, uh, is, that, that four degrees of warming would be incompatible with the maintenance of human civilization. Professor Sheldon Huber, who we talked about earlier, who wrote the Forte report several years ago, said if you got to four degrees of warming, the carrying capacity of the planet would probably be one billion people. And this is well understood. I mean, in fact, there's no work out saying if you got to three degrees of warming, you'd be in serious existential risk. I mean, think about it, 25, 30 metres of sea level rise. How many nations would disappear? One metre of sea level rise will flood 20% of Bangladesh, 30 million people. One level of sea level rise will flood half the Mekong Valley, which is Vietnam's food source. Uh, one metre of sea level rise will take out a large number of coastal cities around the world. So it is clear that in the three to four degree range, we are talking about the end of human civilization as we know it. And yet the Paris Agreement, as we, as we discussed earlier, is currently a, a warming range of three to five degrees. So we are on course for, if not the complete end of human civilization, changes to w- which would make our society now unrecognisable in 100 years' time. Well, here's what I want to know. Should I still take my dream trip to Greece or buy a heavier pickup truck? Uh, I think you should sit on top of a mountain and uh, (laughs) take a whole lot of CEOs from the world's leading countries and sit there until you think about it deeply and for a long time and they see the light coming out of the mountain the next morning. Yes, you see, uh, you know, my question was half serious because we are so straddled between a pretty comfortable present for for most of us and a surreal future that you and I have been talking about somewhere over the cliff. It's enough to drive us crazy, and I wonder if we're not starting to experience a kind of uh, pre-climate stress disorder. Look, we are, and psychologists are pointing to that. Um, I mean, even in Australia, we've had a, a very severe drought on the, uh, in eastern Australia, which has uh, affected a lot of our farming community, and the suicide rate goes up. I mean, this is, a, in part, a climate warming driven health impact. So that, that is true. I mean, I think there's almost a psychological feedback that because the climate policy making system is so wedded to a business-as-usual approach, not accepting that we actually face an emergency and need emergency action, the worse the problem gets, the more policymakers want to ignore it because it would actually upset the apple cart, the policymaking apple cart um, which, they, which they sit in. So yes, I think those processes are, are, are at work. And the, the real issue is that whether it's in politics or in business, our time horizons have, have shortened from decades to years over, over a recent period. I mean, businesses used to think 20, 30 years ahead. Now they have three-year uh, investment horizons. It's the short-term nature of things which is really our enemy. David Spratt, you've been ringing the Code Red alarm for some years now. What keeps you at it? Well, p- people say climate change is all about fear or hope. You know, should we be positive and just say it's all right and put renewable energy or be drowned by the fear? I don't think it's either. I think what probably keeps me going, you going, is the courage to speak the truth to the circumstances we face uh, because we know this is uh, going to have a devastating effect on, on both human and natural systems and that's something that's uh, so morally disturbing that we just can't sit by. Right. Do you have any new projects to tell us about or final thoughts as we wrap up here? Well, look, I think one of the interesting things is we've been um, thinking a little bit about how you you um, talk about climate change to conservatives, because obviously in Australia, uh, a very large fossil uh, fuel producing nation of our five main exports that are in order roughly iron ore, gas, overseas tourism, and foreign students flying into Australia. So we're, we're very uh, fossil fuel dependent and we're very partisan politics as there has been, is in the United States and has been in Canada. And I think it's really interesting to, to think about climate change and pitching climate change not as an economic opportunity, not framing it as a green or environmental issue, which I think has been disastrous in, in terms of creating a part of politics, but actually to talk in the way we have. The duty of the government is to protect the people. The people are now going to suffer an existential threat. Uh, and what are those consequences? So it's not an economic debate. It's not a green versus non-green debate. It's, it's a debate about 
where the human civilization will, will survive. And we have found that that discussion has been quite effective in, in, in engaging conservatives more than some of the uh, traditional findings. From Melbourne, Australia, we've been talking with author and climate writer David Spratt. You can find his work at climatecodered.org and look for his report with Ian Dunlop called What Lies Beneath. I will put links to all that in my weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. David, thank you so much for spending time again with us. Great pleasure, and thank you very much, Alex. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.